The City of Evanston has about 42 boards and commissions. We think we have a Guinness World Record, but uh, uh, we're not entirely sure. But uh, 42 boards and commissions uh, that do everything imaginable and then many things you probably have never imagined. Um, and we have uh, several hundred Evanston residents who are involved in various aspects of uh, the work of our boards and commissions. And uh, in talking with the City Council and uh, the, the legal and voters of Evanston, that was also a, a, a very vigilant partner uh, in, in how we operate, especially our boards and commissions, given the scope and the number of people that are involved. Uh, we felt that it was important to do a more regular training, uh, especially for those folks that are new to the City of Evanston, new to the City of Evanston government, and new to the various boards and commissions that you're part of. So uh, our goal for tonight is to just to try to give you a little bit of context. Uh, we're not going to spend uh, very much time at all talking about the roles and responsibilities of the individual uh, boards and commissions. But what we're going to try to do is give you uh, an overview of uh, sort of the context in which you work. Uh, we have members of our law department here tonight, in which we'll talk a little bit about the, the rules and regulations that deal with, uh, with open government and, and deal with how we operate the public meetings, because all of our boards and commissions are our, our, our public bodies under the uh, statutes of the state of Illinois, and so there are uh, certain requirements that are, are necessary for the operation of those meetings. So we'll go through that. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the city government uh, in Evanston to help you have a, a better understanding of sort of the context of uh, how your individual board and commission works within uh, the structure of the city. And probably most important of all, we'll be here to answer any and all questions you may have about the city, about how all the boards and commissions work within the city. But I thought before we start all that, it might be useful uh, to go around the room and just uh, have everyone introduce themselves, say who they are, uh, and, and the board and commission that you're a part of. Um, we don't have a wireless mic. We are recording this for those individuals who couldn't make it tonight, so we'll put that up on the internet for people to look at later. So you wouldn't mind just talking loudly uh, so your folks can, can start and, and join. I, I know talking, I hope talking loudly is okay. So we'll, we'll start with you. What board and commission are you on? Serving, 
Um, and if there's a matter before the board, um, the Board of Ethics just needs to be aware of it, and we might um, give you guidance to recuse yourself on that matter if it's ever before the board. Um, and it'll discuss, you have a zoning matter before the city. What type of business do you have? Is it ever doing business with the city? Those types of questions. And if it's not applicable to you, put NA. Um, please don't make a point. The, the Board of Ethics reviews these statements and make sure that um, everything is in compliance with the Code of Ethics. So those are due annually, every year. So if you fill one out when you first start, you'll get it again the following year. So um, it's, due, it's due in the next couple weeks. Um, so the Code of Ethics is devoted to basically three issues. Um, the first is that it wants to um, address um, what is prohibited and what is allowed in terms of political activities. Um, it talks about um, prohibitions on solicitation of gifts and what is it, and exceptions to that rule. So as a board of commission member, you couldn't accept a gift except for a wedding or if it's a birthday party. You know, it provides for all of those exceptions. And then the Code of Ethics also talks about just trying to be as impartial as you can and as unbiased as you can as you operate within your position. Um, and then unauthorized use of public property is simply um, discussing if you have a matter before the board um, that you're not you know, using it, improper influence um, and that type of thing. So the next slide. Um, so we talked about that. So the two statutes are really devoted to the concept of transparency. Open Meetings Act and Open Freedom of Information Act is trying to ensure that the matters of the city of Evanston are as transparent as we can. Um, the city is devoted to this concept. Um, we upload a voluminous amount of information onto the city's website, um, public documents. If you don't think it's available, I promise you it is. It is on the website somewhere. Um, and so we try to operate that way as much as we possibly can. Um, the Open Meetings Act basically says that we need to follow certain procedures to make sure that it's open. Um, and so you need to post a, an agenda, a notice, and you need to take minutes. The city staff member that is assigned to all of your board and commission members has gone through a training. Um, so they are well versed in how to post the notice. It needs to be 48 hours before the meeting, um, or the agenda actually, the notice needs to be 70. Um, and how to take minutes. Minutes are important to their action minutes. What happened at that meeting? So the agenda is going to list the topics, and the minutes are going to give a summary of the discussion, and then what action actually happened. It's not going to be, I said this, he said that. It's not going to be a verbatim dialogue. Um, and so it's just really just how we operate um, in good governance. Um, citizen comments are always provided. We want to make sure that people's voices can be heard. Um, and that's what really the Open Meetings Act is devoted to. How important is it to have the names of those who attended and did not attend that meeting? The members of the commission? And the who are, yeah. So, oh, it's very important. Yeah. Um, so right at the beginning of the meeting, the chair of your board needs to assess if there's a quorum present. Yeah. Um, so let's say you have a nine-member board. Your quorum will be five. So purpose of the meeting is actually have three prongs to determine if you have a meeting. First is, do you have a majority of your quorum? So for that example, the majority of your quorum would be three. As soon as you have three people sitting, you have a meeting. Um, and then we'll get into it later, but email can also create a meeting. Um, so it's very important. Once you have that threshold level um, number of persons, then it actually starts the meeting. No, but what I'm inquiring about is having their names on the minutes. Yes. Those who are there, those who are not. Yes. I, I have a problem with that. In various meetings that I'm in, I tell people that it is supposed to list the names of everybody. They, they, they don't they, they don't get it. We, well we just need to document which members of the commission were there and which ones were absent so we document how the form was established yeah, yeah. Okay. If, if anybody has a question they certainly call me um, I won't cover everything for the open exact so if you have a question that I'm going to cover feel free to call me um, and yes yeah, so we're through that um, so 
the your staff member will, will make sure that all of these things happen. But basically, the city needs to ensure that um, the agenda is posted. It's always done here at the Civic Center in the elevator. Um, and we provide notice to the media so they know what's happening. We always put it up on the city's website. Interested persons can know what's happening at that agenda. Are you interested in that topic? No, not really. Okay, well, let's see what's on the next agenda. Um, and then it needs to stay the time and the place and the room number. Um, and then the agenda items need to be um, specific enough to give people an understanding of what's actually going to be discussed. And the agenda should never say new business, old business, um, adjournment. That the meeting should give new business and some line items. This might be really elementary, but um, I'm just giving the most basic um, explanation of what the meeting is actually. But it, it can't give like one word explanations. It actually needs to give an understanding of what actually is going to be discussed. And it needs to comply with the American with Disabilities Act. So what this means is that um, meetings can't take place at a private home. Um, it needs to be accessible for people. Um, and so it needs to be in places where people will feel welcome and it's physically accessible. So the Levy Center, um, community centers, the library, here at the Civic Center, those are all typical public meeting places. Um, so there are certain exceptions to the uh, Open Meetings Act. Those are extremely rare. I don't think that probably any of you need to worry about this part of the statute. Um, it deals with topics of personnel issues, um, union contracts, does the city want to buy and sell real estate? Um, but otherwise, the meeting should be open. It should never be closed to the public. Um, so we talked about that, that meetings need to have action items on the published agenda. Um, so yeah, we already went over that. And, oh, email. Okay. With new technology, it actually created, creates an issue of, for the Open Meetings Act. Um, if you have a, a, an email, let's say a city staff member sent you a copy of the packet. This is what we're going to be discussing next Tuesday. Or a uh, communication. Um, if all of the members are in that email, please do not reply all. Um, unless it's something like what time will be or you know, a very basic question, because that's going to trigger um, what's called contemporaneous communication. So it'll create a reply all and a conversation, and that's what we want to avoid, because then you're starting to talk about public business. You're going to start to talk about what's on the agenda. Um, you can talk about if you want questions of clarification, like I had said, you know, what time is it, or um, who's going to be speaking, questions like that. But otherwise, please do not reply all. Okay, the Freedom of Information Act is along the same lines in transparency, but basically it's um, requests for documents. Um, so, I, maybe some of you don't know, but the records that you produce for your commissions, those are all going to be part of the city's public records that we have to keep for a period of time, and they um, are subject to requests. Um, so let's say the Preservation Commission has an application before it um, for a certain address. And in the FOIA, it requests that I would like copies of any and all email correspondence between the city staff and the commission members about 2530 Lake Street or something. And on the zoning board or the preservation commission application, that is subject to FOIA. Um, and all of those emails, even though they're not in your server, they are discussing public business and they're with members of the commission and they're with the city staff member, that is potentially subject to FOIA. So um, the city has a very tight deadline, but it talks about FOIA. You only get five business days to respond to those FOIAs. So how this will work is that the city will receive a request, the city clerk's office gets it, and the city staff member, if they need something from you, they will reach out to you immediately and send you a copy of the request, and they'll ask you what they actually need. But it will probably be email. We have everything else. Um, so then you just need to make sure that if you have responsive records, that you pass those on so that we can um, disseminate them to the requester. Um, there are some circumstances where we can request an additional five days, but um, we try to abide by the deadline as much as we can. So, um, what constitutes a public record? It is an extremely broad definition. Um, it, all of the, what you think may not be a public record, it is. Um, and then there are certain exceptions to actual disclosure. Um, for
for an example, if, if I am emailing one of my city staff members and I'm giving them a legal opinion, I could potentially withhold that under attorney communications. Um, so there's a certain exceptions, but they're very narrow. And um, the law department, um, I saw for multiple attorneys, we would review it and see if it's, um, if it's exempt. So I went through that really fast. <laughs> does, does anybody have any questions? Because I actually have to run to the board of ethics meeting after this, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> any questions about the Means Act, Code of Ethics, FOIA? No? Great. I, I, I think probably the, the one of the biggest issues that you would all face uh, is email. Um, there are some boards that never communicate by email, and there are some boards that communicate a lot by email. And uh, those are all public records, and any discussion, as, as Michelle indicated, any discussion that you have uh, by email, uh, you can't do because that's in essence conducting a meeting as a non public. So, uh, really, I think well, all of the issues that were raised, that's probably the most important thing. Really, uh, use email to get agendas, use email perhaps just to check the meeting time, uh, but really don't anything else because all of that could be, uh, we could request that we get copies of your email, all of that could be in the newspaper uh, tomorrow. So, uh, please, please be mindful of that. All right, well, unless there's any other questions for Michelle, we'll let her get off to the Board of Ethics, whose job it is to enforce the city's uh, code of ethics and to review the various uh, uh, financial disclosure reports, which are out right now, and we'll start looking at them soon. So, great. So we'll move on then to uh, an overview of government. And again, uh, I will apologize in advance. We want to make sure that we cover things as completely and thoroughly as possible. Many of you have been in the community a long time. Uh, our intention here is not to insult your intelligence in any way, but really make sure that we have everybody on the same page. Uh, the city of Evanston um, was incorporated in, in 1863. Uh, what really probably matters the most is when the Illinois Constitution uh, was uh, amended substantially in 1970. Uh, and so the, the, really the forms of government that we operate under are really uh, can be traced back to the 1970 uh, Constitutional Convention, which created the current version of the state constitution. Uh, we are a city. There are cities and villages in Illinois. If you're a city, uh, you elect aldermen. If you're a village, you, you elect trustees. Uh, if you're a city, you elect uh, uh, by ward or district. If you're a village, uh, you elect at large. So that's probably the biggest difference between cities and villages. There are also, of course, townships, except in Evanston, uh, where we may no longer have a township, but there are uh, 1,600 townships in addition to uh, cities and, and villages. So we are a, a home rule uh, a city. There are build of what? So it's less than 100, I think, uh, home rule communities out of the approximately 600 cities and villages in Illinois. About 100 of us are home rule. You can be home rule uh, regardless of size uh, in Illinois, but being a home rule city allows you to uh, create laws as long as the state of Illinois has not created a law uh, that, that, that takes that ability away. So home rule communities have the ability to tax a um, whole variety of different things have uh, a broader uh, abilities to regulate uh, a whole variety of different things. So we are a, a home rule community. Uh, in Illinois, you can have various forms of government to uh, to govern a city. Uh, there is the uh, strong mayor form of government. The city of Chicago, for example, is a strong mayor form of government where uh, the mayor is the chief executive. The mayor appoints the department directors. Um, and the, the city council uh, uh, meets, approves budget, has other authorities, uh, but, but in a strong mayor form, uh, the mayor is the chief executive. Uh, there is a city administrator form of government in Illinois where the mayor himself or herself appoints uh, a, a, a city administrator. That city administrator reports to uh, either the mayor or the mayor and city council, depending on the form. Uh, also, in a city administrator form of government, uh, the, the various department heads uh, can be either appointed by the mayor, appointed by the council, or appointed by the administrator, and depending on the community, there's a mix of that. And then we have the form that we have here in Evanston, which is known as the council manager uh, form of government. So uh, in Evanston, uh, the city council, which is uh, a nine aldermen elected by ward, a mayor who's elected at large, 
Those 10 individuals hire a city manager. The city manager serves as the chief executive of the city. The city manager administers and enforces laws, advises the council, supervises and appoints the department heads, and sort of serves as the CEO. So if you were to think of a private sector equivalency, the city manager is the CEO of the corporation, the city council is the board of directors, and the mayor is the chair of the board. So in Evanston, the mayor presides over the city council. The mayor does not have a vote. Only in five or six very specific circumstances does the mayor have a vote. In the case of ties, in the case of certain financial issues, and the city manager or the mayor has a vote in the hiring and firing of the city manager. So the mayor here in Evanston really serves as the community leader. In addition to presiding at the city council meetings, the mayor makes appointments to all the boards and commissions. So all of you here tonight, I think without exception, were appointed by the mayor to serve on your various boards and commissions. Again, she presides, can't veto. Again, it serves as the chief spokesperson and as the leader of the community. Next slide is the city clerk. Again, city clerks in Illinois can either be appointed or elected. In Evanston's case, the city clerk is an elected official, elected at the same time. Also, the city council and mayor are all elected at the same time, which is a little bit unusual. Nationally, it's a little bit unusual in Illinois, but the mayor, city council, and city clerk are all elected at the same time. So in 2017, about two years from now, will be the election for the ten members of the council plus the city clerk. So the city clerk serves as the secretary to the city council that is responsible for record keeping. Can we go back to the slide? In case I missed something. The custodian of the Evanston city code. So the city code serves as sort of the rules and regulations on which we operate under, in addition to the general laws of the state of Illinois, and is also responsible for issuing notices. So as Ms. Mason-Cutt mentioned, the boards and commissions have to issue notice of their meetings. The city clerk's office generally is the central repository of that, and the staff members that you have on your board and commission work with the city clerk's office to make sure that that information is made available. Next is the city council. Nine aldermen elected by ward. I think you're all familiar with the map from north to south. The city council has a vacancy as of Friday. Alderman Colleen Burris, the ninth ward alderman, has resigned. So there's a vacancy in a council seat after 22 months of the term. The mayor has the ability to appoint. So we are about 28 or 29 months into the current term, so the mayor has the ability to appoint. And so we'll make an appointment here pretty soon for a new ninth ward alderman, and that individual will serve until the next general municipal election in 2017. But the council serves as the board of directors of the city. They adopt legislation, set policy, approve the annual budget. They provide advice and consent to mayoral appointments. So all of you who were appointed, your name appeared before the city council. The city council had to approve your appointment. Also for the vacancy with the alderman, that appointment from the mayor also has to be approved. Members of the city council at least serve on one standing committee of the city council, which we'll talk about in a second. And they also have liaison responsibilities now to all the boards and commissions. The standing committee, there are four standing committees of the city council, so the work of the council does not happen so much at city council meetings as it does in the four standing committees of the council. The council's rules committee oversees the rules of operation of the city council. They deal with legislative matters. They deal with business such as the schedule and term of chairs of the standing committees. So, for example, with the new alderman coming on board at the next meeting of the rules committee, that committee will decide how we address the vacancy of Alderman Burris on the various boards and commissions, or the various standing committees. She's currently chair of the administration and public works committee, so that position will be filled. So the rules committee deals with those sort of administrative matters. Our human services committee deals with oversight of our human services operations and our health and human services department, our parks, recreation, and community services department. Also has a function in reviewing police complaints 
Uh, so those two committees, Rules and Human Services, meet once a month uh, on the first Monday of each month. Uh, the Administration of Public Works and Planning and Development Committee meet just prior to the City Council's uh, meetings on the second and fourth Mondays of the month. The Administration of Public Works Committee uh, deals with those matters of finance, public works, uh, our utilities uh, department, um, planning and development deals with mostly land use issues. And so those, com those committees again meet twice a month. So the idea is I, any issue that comes before the City Council first comes before one of the standing committees uh, and there's a recommendation made and then that item is then placed on a full City Council agenda on the, either the second or fourth Monday of the month. Um, so we've got the first, second, and fourth Monday of the month covered, so of course we have to do something on the third Monday. Um, and so on the third Monday of the month, the Council meets uh, as a group to discuss citywide matters. So that meeting does not always happen, for example, did not happen last night. Um, this month, uh, but uh, the council has meetings the first, second, third, and fourth Mondays of every month in some form or another. Uh, each of these standing committees, we can go back, each of the standing committees have responsibilities for boards and commissions. So if there are issues that come from your board or commission, um, they would likely then come to administration, public works, human services, or planning and development. Uh, depending on what that issue is. Uh, a few of the uh, committees that include all of them have the ability to send items directly to the, the City Council, the Housing and Community Development Act Committee, the Economic Development Committee, and I'm missing at least one, but there's a, a handful of those um, that report directly to the Council. Um, next slide. Uh, special committees are appointed. Um, there can be special committees of aldermen. There can be special committees of aldermen and residents. Uh, all special committees are appointed by the mayor. Uh, the Harley Clark Committee, for example, is an example of a special committee appointed by the mayor that consists of both uh, citizens and aldermen. Uh, we had a, a housing and or had a homelessness task force. Uh, a few years back, that was primarily a citizen-based committee, so there's a mix of those. So when we say we've got 42 uh, committees, that includes three or four uh, special committees at any given time as well. Uh, we've talked about the council meetings. Um, your service on boards and commissions, so how does this fit? Why are you here? Why do you do what you do? Um, Evanston is a very process-oriented community. Evanston has, has a community standard that said we want to hear what the residents think, and that should be part of the policy process. So our various boards and commissions uh, exist uh, to provide advice and counsel uh, to the city council. Um, there's a 35 member, I always include the council committees too, so that's what takes up a couple of the numbers. So uh, that role is important. I think there's sometimes a struggle um, with members of boards and commissions who feel frustrated that the city council doesn't listen to them, the city council does not use them as well as they should. And I will tell you that the city council is equally frustrated. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've been working on, I've been working on with the direction of the council over the last few years, is what we can do to help make the work of the boards and commissions more meaningful for you, make the advice and counsel that you provide back to the city council as meaningful as possible, um, pay more attention uh, to the procedures, again, just the operation of all these various boards and commissions uh, takes a fair amount of uh, diligence on our staff's part, uh, but we're, we're continuing to focus more on that. Mr. Precioso, one of her day-to-day uh, -day jobs now is uh, uh, making sure that this process works again. Uh, kudos to the League of Women Voters of Evanston, who have been very big advocates of making sure that the Board of Commission process in Evanston works functionally. Um, it's still a work in progress. Uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, so each of the Board of Commissions hold one of the following types of responsibility, either administrative, advisory, or quasi-judicial. So the administrative boards and commissions develop and administer their own programs and budgets. Uh, that would be something like the Mental Health Board, um, um, uh, from an administrative perspective. We've got lots of quasi-judicial ones, all the land use ones, plan and preservation. Um, the zoning, uh, the zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, most of our boards and commissions, however, fall under the advisory category where uh, there's a set of issues uh, that you're asked to look at, looking around where we're talking about where some of you are from. Parks and Rec is a good example of an advisory board. Um, the, uh, a, the, the Age Friendly Task Force is a great example of an advisory board. So of the, the group of boards and commissions we have, the vast majority are there to provide advice and counsel. Uh, to the city council. 
accountability. The Board's Commission's report is one of the four standing committees, as we talked about, uh, the primary roles, uh, the members, the chairperson, staff liaisons, and administrative staff. So we have staff from all over the city uh, that provide the support. Some of our staff members uh, do this sort of thing on a regular basis, others not. And so we try to make sure that each of the Board's Commissions have staff liaisons and administrative staff uh, that are appropriate to provide the support that you need. Next slide. Um, so what are your responsibilities as a Board of Commission member? Well, certainly we hope that your schedule allows you to attend as many meetings as possible. Uh, we're usually pretty good about uh, uh, the schedules of our meetings. They're usually uh, on a fixed date um, each month. So uh, we hope that you will attend those meetings, that you will learn what those responsibilities are. We encourage the staff uh, that's, that support each of our boards and commissions to meet with new members, uh, to provide an appropriate orientation uh, to the work of the board and commission. Um, if that's not happening, please let me know, and I will make sure that it does. I'm also trying to meet more regularly with the chairs of the boards and commissions so that they can provide feedback. So if uh, the staffing is not working, uh, their feedback for that slide. Um, we ask that you prepare for each meeting. We try to get the agendas out uh, three, four days in advance of your meeting so that you have them to, to study. And again, because of the different responsibilities uh, that each of our boards and commissions have, uh, some have very lengthy, detailed packets with lots of background information, and, and some may have perhaps just an agenda, hopefully as detailed as Ms. Mason Cup said is required. Uh, but we would ask that you uh, uh, prepare for those meetings, ask questions, contact uh, your uh, staff members, your committee and board chairs, if you have questions, to participate actively. Um, one of the challenges that we have with these with boards and commissions is people come and people go. So um, sometimes it will take people a few meetings to kind of get up to speed as to what the board is all about. Um, and then you'll have people on the board who've been there a very long time. And, and we ask our, our staff and, and the chairs of the boards and commissions to try to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. Um, I think probably we are sometimes more successful than other times with that. But certainly we continue to work with the chairs and staff to make sure that that happens. Observe meeting decorum. Some meetings, this is not an issue at all. On some boards and commissions, this is a huge issue. Um, it's either a huge issue because, um, for whatever reason, members of the boards and commission um, have, have difficulty understanding that participate actively means not always talking. Uh, and so, uh, again, chairs and, 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 and city staff work uh, to make sure that happens. In some cases, boards and commissions have uh, members of the public attend. How many of you regularly see members of the public? at your board of commission with well, just a couple of hands. So again, we've got, it runs the gamut for some of our boards of commissions, especially the advisory judicial ones, uh, they will regularly see developers and attorneys and residents before them. Um, other groups may rarely see. Sometimes you will get a member of the public who comes and, and feels that they have an issue that they want to be heard, um, and sometimes the issue of quorum is difficult. So we work with the chairs, we work with staff to make sure that that all uh, happens. Really the goal here is to have a dialogue. The goal is to allow each of our boards and commissions to operate in a way uh, that can provide information back to the City Council uh, on matters facing the City Council. Next slide. Uh, the Chair, again, a fairly straightforward you know, role for the Chair. They work with staff on meeting agendas, uh, conduct the meetings professionally and efficiently, uh, follow parliamentary procedure, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, moderate discussions even handily, devote time to member development. And again, that's sometimes difficult too because you're all busy people, you all have lives outside of this. Um, again, the staff of the, of the Board of Commission tries to work closely and makes, and makes sense to do what, uh, what works for each individual Board of Commission. We consider to the public, we talk about guide interactions, support the work and efforts of city staff and council, uh, and we've been working on work plans. Um, again, one of the recommendations that we received from the legal and voters of Edison was to try to have a little bit more uh, a tight goals and, and a work plan associated with the work of the board's commission. Staff liaison, again, I think we've covered most, most of these things. And next slide. Rules of order and procedure. Um, the city council has its own separate set of rules and procedure. Um, they then fall back, and now there are no matters that are not covered under the rules of procedure, covered by something called Robert's Rules of Order, um, a long-standing uh, 
parliamentary procedure uh, document that was created uh, many moons ago um, to help all sorts of deliberative bodies uh, operate. So while we do not hold, the city council does not hold itself to Robert's Rules of Order, we do not ask the boards and commissions uh, to hold themselves to Robert's Rules of Order. They do provide a framework uh, to allow meetings to happen, to allow motions to be made, um, so that the, uh, uh, the clear will of the board or commission is understood uh, as you go through. So, um, let's talk about all that. Um, the quorum issue, uh, we generally, um, the boards and commissions just worry about the quorum to conduct business, and that is the, the simple majority. But there is something here in Illinois known as the majority of the quorum. And so that's why, um, even if you don't have we, we try to make this as simple as possible. So if you don't have a majority members of your, your, your board of commission, you should not be discussing business period. Because even if you have something less than a majority, and a majority of quorum, um, you know, that causes problems. So some, I think that's one thing we really, uh, you know, come home with staff. Sometimes people will say, if it's a, if it's a seven member group and you've got three people there, the people will say, hey, well, let's just talk about stuff anyway. Uh, we instruct the staff to kind of throw themselves in front of the train and say, no, 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 you really can't do that. Um, so I think that's, and that also goes back to the whole issue of email. Um, we would rather just not make your lives complicated. So, you know, the message about not emailing back and forth, and then if you do not have a civil majority present, you should not be conducting business at all. So, um, next slide. Order of business, uh, again, this is a very straightforward agenda format, which hopefully all of you have seen in the groups that you have. Uh, the call to order the, the, the establishment of the quorum, you know, the minutes when we ask the staff that they do not have to do verbatim minutes, that action minutes are sufficient. The city council has a policy uh, that action minutes are sufficient. Many of our boards and commissions don't like this. They, they want to see everything that was said in writing. Um, and so we try to work collegially with the, between the staff and the board of the official direction to the staff of all of our boards and commissions with the exception of the city council's four standing committees is that action minutes are sufficient. Uh, committee reports, if there are subcommittees, staff reports, unfinished business, new business, all this should be delineated uh, to the best that you can on the agenda itself so that members of the public who are seeing these agendas online or posted have an idea of what's being discussed. Uh, any communication is in the journal. So we have a, a, a short video um, that kind of goes through all this. So you're the first group seeing this, so uh, if you think it's if it's useful, please let us know. If you think it's ridiculous, please let us know. Uh, but we wanted to try to provide something um, in addition to our talking heads tonight. So we'll play with you. Rules of order to work. Let's roll through this sample agenda. First, call the meeting to order at the appointed time. Special programs of an educational or serious nature can be scheduled early in the meeting so guests don't have to wait. Minutes are read by the secretary. The chairperson asks if the minutes are correct. If there are mistakes, they are noted. The chair then states that the minutes are approved as read or as corrected. This can also be done with a consent agenda if the minutes are sent out to members ahead of time. The treasurer's report is submitted by the treasurer along with receipts and expenses. The chair calls for the questions. The chair then declares the treasurer's report will be placed in the record subject to an audit. The report is not approved until it has been audited. Committee reports are presented to the group. First standing committees, then special committees. Written committee reports may be presented to the secretary if critical information is included. Old business should be indicated in the minutes. If there is none, then move on. New business is then in order. Address one item at a time. Special programs of entertainment should occur after the business of the meeting has been completed. Adjourn the meeting when all the business has been completed. 
This can be done by a motion, which requires a second and a vote, or the chair can declare the meeting adjourned by general consent. Remember, if a closed session is to be conducted as part of the meeting, it must be included on the agenda and it must state the reason for the closed session. Keeping accurate minutes is very important. This slide shows what should be included in minutes as a good practice. However, the Missouri Sunshine Law allows for less. The date and location of the meeting, attendees, and any votes taken. This minimal requirement under the Sunshine Law is why a meeting can be audio or video recorded. Everyone's been in a meeting like this, right? Whatever the secretary writes down will be okay, right? No. Be specific and state details in motions. That way the minutes truly document the decisions of the membership. For unfinished business, be sure to read the minutes of the previous meeting as you develop the agenda. Unfinished business or old business is the business that the minutes tell you needs to be addressed or completed. There is no need to ask for unfinished business. If it is not in the minutes, there is no unfinished business to address. Introducing new business involves making a main motion. A member rises, addresses the chair, and is recognized by the chairperson. Once recognized by the chair, the member may state the proposed plan of action by coming directly to the point, or the member may give a brief reason or explanation why he or she is introducing the motion before actually stating the motion. Don't make the motion and discuss it all in the same sentence. A little informal consultation before the question is stated often saves time. Say, I move when you make the motion, not I make a motion or I move you. The second the motion is prompted, don't waste time by making the chair ask the obvious question, do I hear a second? If no second, then the motion dies for a lack of a second. To discuss a motion, be recognized by the chair before you begin that discussion. Be sure you discuss only the motion at hand. Direct all comments to the chair, not the person who made the motion. Ask questions for clarification if needed. The chair can provide facts not known to other members, such as the cost of something perhaps. And be professional. The chair must retain control of the meeting. Cut off arguments immediately. Remind members that they need to be recognized by the chair before they speak and ask them to address their comments to the chair. Avoid saying you are out of order. This only elevates the problem and puts the chair in the middle of the argument. Calling for the question is one way a member can suggest that discussion end and the vote be taken. However, it does not automatically end discussion. It just means that one person is ready to vote. The chair will often say the question has been called. If there is no further discussion on the motion, we shall proceed to vote. There's also a motion to close debate. This may be necessary if a few members continue to discuss the motion after the issues have been presented. This is useful when no new opinions have been shared and the discussion is going nowhere. Closing the debate motion requires a two-thirds majority vote. The chair brings the discussion to a close and moves forward with a vote when it is obvious that the debate has served its purpose. The chair should then restate the motion and then take the vote. Always vote affirmative first, opposed last. The voting can be done by voice, voice vote or a show of hands 
or by a counted vote. The chair announces the results of the vote and declares it has either carried or been defeated. If a member questions the result of the vote, the member can call for the division. The chairperson must immediately then take a standing vote of the members. The motion to refer something to a committee should be made carefully. If a committee is authorized to act on behalf of the board, they assume the authority of the board to make decisions regarding this particular assignment. The committee can be asked to perform a fact-finding function or to perform a specific task. In your motion, be clear as to the expectations and powers that are being granted. A committee acts for the organization and a report back to the main body should be done. A committee is established to investigate, so that means reporting the facts that it finds. Uh, a motion or vote may be necessary for acceptance of the report by the main body. And the facts should be used in deciding upon the appropriate action. And the committees can also investigate and prepare recommendations. This can involve gathering facts, preparing recommendations, and sometimes committees will be asked to actually present recommendations to the group in the form of a main motion. When making a motion, if you do not know what to do, ask. The motion to table is used to lay aside an item of business temporarily in order to attend to more important business. Don't lay a motion on the table for the purpose of killing it or postponing it. Sometimes it's necessary to make a motion to suspend the rules, to follow a procedure uh, which is ordinarily against the rules of the group. For example, you may suspend the rules to change an established meeting date. A tabled motion cannot be taken from the table unless another item of business has been transacted since the motion was tabled. However, it should be taken from the table before the meeting ends. Postponing to another time is the correct motion to use to delay action to another day. The motion to table is often used incorrectly for this purpose. To postpone indefinitely is used to kill a motion without bringing it to a vote. The motion to table is often used incorrectly for this purpose. An amendment motion can be made to do one of three things. Add words, strike out words, or substitute. The person wishing to make an amendment must be recognized by the chair and then state the amendment. The chairperson restates the motion as amended and calls for discussion of the amended motion. The chairperson calls for and announces the result of the vote on the amended motion. If the amendment does not carry, then the original motion is still before the group as if no amendment had been offered. A member may rise to a point of order without waiting to be recognized. The member explains the nature of the violation. The chairperson then indicates his decision. The member may appeal when the chair does not convince him or her that the ruling is correct. The group then decides who is correct by a show of hands. All those who agree, who agree with the decision of the chair, please raise your hands. Those opposed, same sign. Sometimes a motion is made and the person making the motion decides it is not a viable motion. That person may simply request to withdraw the motion. The chair asks if there are any objections, and if none are stated, the motion is withdrawn. If there is an objection to the request to withdraw, the motion must be voted on. A motion to reconsider is made when a person who originally voted on the prevailing side of the decision asks to reconsider the vote. The motion to repeal is out of order if something has been done which the group cannot do. 
it requires a two-thirds majority. For example, you can't vote to repeal purchasing something that has already been purchased. When it comes to making nominations, these slides show the basics. The chair of the nominating committee submits recommendations. The chair asks if there are further recommendations. Then a motion to close the nominations is made. Never make a motion to elect by acclamation. Voice vote is best. Nominations can come from the floor. A second is not needed for nominations. And votes should be taken in the same order that the names were nominated. Parliamentary procedure is based on two democratic principles. It recognizes majority rule and it protects the rights and privileges of the individual. I hope this presentation on parliamentary procedure from University of Missouri Extension has been helpful. So that was, I think, a longer, more um, detailed version than likely you're going to need to, to, to know in, in the course of your board and commission though, service. But still, a good, good overview, I think, of uh, uh, more broad uh, issues with parliamentary procedure. So this slide talks about the, the things that, that you probably need to know the most as far as making a motion uh, and any any business to move forward, any formal declaration of your board and commission will come through a motion. Uh, occasionally some of the uh, other judicial groups will have a draft of ordinance or a resolution, which is a more formal written uh, statement, declaration of, of intent. But normally it, it is a motion. Uh, there is, it is moved, it is seconded, it is discussed and it's voted upon. Um, that is a very standard procedure that you will see with the board and commission. Next slide. Um, so I think we, what we tried to do tonight is give you an overview of the city, give you an overview of some of the legal applications, give you an overview of, uh, of uh, sort of the policies and procedures. Uh, but most importantly, I really just want to say thank you. Uh, you take time away from your family, your businesses, and other uh, services you provide uh, in the community uh, to help the city of Evanston uh, with its work. So thank you on behalf of Mayor Tisdall and members of the city council for that. Uh, and really we'd just be happy to open it up to the floor for any questions about anything you've heard tonight or really anything else you'd like to find. Oh, sure. Final slides. So final thoughts uh, for communications. Um, are you registered for e-news and other relevant correspondent notices? One of the things we learned uh, uh, last fall I'm talking with the board chairs was that many folks are not signed up in, with the various ways we already communicate uh, with the public. And so if you are not getting our, our Thursday uh, e-news, you go to our website, cityofemiston.org, and you can sign up for that. Um, there's about 35,000 uh, Evanston residents who get our e-news uh, every week. Uh, we also have e-newsletters for a whole variety of other things uh, that go on here, so we would encourage you uh, to look at the list when you sign up, uh, and there may be other things you'd like to, to sign up for. We're also very active on social media, so you can follow us at City of Evanston uh, on Twitter. Uh, we have a second uh, Twitter feed we use for special events. We have our city departments, police and fire, and utilities and public works and library all have their own Twitter feed. So if you're interested in following news uh, on Twitter for any of those, you can. Uh, we are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can stay abreast of, of issues happening here in the city. Uh, training we have made. There's a board and commission handbook. Again, uh, thanks to uh, the work of the Evanston uh, Regional Voters. Uh, our city staff, we put that together a couple of years ago, which we hope you all have access to. If you don't, if you go on the main board commission uh, webpage on our website, there's a link to that there. Um, do you know where to get a copy of Robert's Rules? Where do you get a copy of Robert's Rules? At the library. Oh, that was another true question. Um, uh, well, probably other places too, but uh, we don't provide we don't provide uh, copies of our rules. I think what you've heard tonight is probably the lion's share of what we probably need to know anyway. But uh, so we can go to the public library to get that. Um, all right. So then I'll go. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah.
procedures are from the state of Illinois. That doesn't look like there's much, <clears throat> excuse me, that's imposed by the city of Evanston. Well, because we don't have to, because we, we, we simply allow the, you know, the, 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 the general laws of the state of Illinois, uh, as far as open meetings are concerned, parliamentary procedure goes back, you know, it obviously predates all of us here. So uh, I think government proceedings have largely been conducted along those lines. So Illinois statutes, I think, generally talk about uh, how many should be open, the notice requirements, things like that. But uh, um, it is mentioned in our uh, Evanston City Code, 
that the city council may adopt its own rules and those issues not covered by those rules are uh, by a proper rules of order. Uh, so that's a very standard. In other communities I've worked over my career that have those kind of sections. So, um, you know, if you were to go to a community someplace else in Illinois, operate very similar to someplace else in the United States, I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, the citizens of uh, Evanston, can they have access to review the minutes of every board? Yes. Where and, and how? It's all on our website. And if people don't have access to that, they can come to the city clerk's office. So we have, we have agendas for boards and commissions, most of them going back eight, ten years. The city council uh, agenda packets, minutes, agendas go back electronically. 1567. So, um, again, for those who don't have access to computers, they can go to the city clerk's office, um, but otherwise, everything's on. Any questions? Yes, Representative from the League of Women Voters, anything you want to add? Uh, we understand that um, there are boards and commissions that are now doing annual reports, and are those are placed on the website as well. They will be. We, we are, we are illness collecting them up. We're going to uh, put together uh, reports based on uh, uh, where the where board's commission report to on standing. So where do we stand on the collection of those reports? I think we're about 75% uh, of our reports to the get final information So my guess is that in May or June, uh, we will submit those to the four standing committees. Uh, and it will be up to them what they do with them, but we'll, the compilations will put it as a PDF and post on website. But if it, it'll, it'll probably be the next. Other questions? Well, then thank you very much again for your service. The residents of Evanston democracy only happens because you all do what you do. So thank you very much for that. Over the final word. Thank you. So thank you again for attending. Um, on the back of your agenda, there's an evaluation form. Just fill that out. And just you can leave that on the table or can just jump on your way out. And also, you just remember to turn in your name that Please cycle and release those. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.